And thank you for our sponsor, premier sponsor, Microsoft Azure. We're here for our mind session on mental health in IT, safeguarding our most, most precious resources, which is our people and their sanity. My name is Tracy Baggiano. My pronouns are she and her. I go by the title of Database Superhero, and I work at DocuSign. Uh, you've already seen it slide a number of times, I assume, by now, but you should explore everything that PASS has to offer. There's a bunch of free resources at PASS.org. Uh, we've got a lot of local user groups, uh, SQL Saturdays, which I'm addicted to speaking at, uh, virtual groups. There's a lot of volunteers that are involved. And you should check out the PASS, PASS Pro membership. At the end of this session, please uh, click on the session evaluation link and... Please give me a rating on how well I did. We have to the end of Friday, November the 20th to be entered into win prizes. Again, my name is Tracy Baggiano. My pronouns are she and her. We went over that. The easiest way to find me is databasesuperhero.com and all my information for connecting to me via LinkedIn, email, or Twitter are all right there. I'm a data platform MVP with over 20 years experience with SQL Server. My favorite job is advocating for abuse and neglected children through the foster care system, though, as a volunteer with the GAL CASA program. Some of our objectives for today are going to be to define mental health, discuss workplace causes of mental health challenges, discuss ways to help yourself, discuss ways to help others, discuss how an employer can provide help, discuss things to help us with this darn pandemic, and provide plenty of resources for you to walk away with to do more research on your own. A little bit more about who I am. For one thing, I'm just a DBA. I'm not a mental health professional. Please take note that. I suffer from mental health issues. I have bipolar and I frequently get depressed and have anxiety. I also have complex PTSD, so I have a tad bit of experience with mental health issues. Every now and then I do get manic from my bipolar and will end up with newer cars and newer laptops as the one that I'm presenting off of. My work has been affected by my mental health, as in I sometimes, you know, can't function and need to take days off or I can't concentrate. Work has affected my mental health. There have been times where I've been so stressed out or burnt out at work that I need days off to get my mental health back into perspective and where it needs to be. And I'm ready to talk publicly about, about it and raise awareness because mental health is a taboo, stigma inside subject matter that no one wants to talk about. And I've done a lot of research on the subject as it relates to IT because there are some statistics that stand out to me when it comes to how it relates to IT. Now one quote I would like for you to take away with you, if nothing else, is mental health isn't just mental illness, it's part of being human. I have no idea where I got that from, so I'm just putting anonymous beside it, but I read it and I loved it. Let's discuss what is mental health. It's the foundation for your emotions, thinking, communication, learning, resilience, and self-esteem. So it's really the makeup of your whole life. If you think about it, you can't feel anything the normal way when your mental health is not, not intact. You think differently, you communicate differently, you can be irritable and grumpy and not communicate as well as you want or withdrawn from people. Learning is hard when you can't concentrate. You don't bounce back from things as well when you're when you're doing when your resiliency is off. And your self esteem is not very well when you're not feeling that well and you're depressed or have anxiety. And it's the key to your relationships, your personal and emotional well being. So you don't relate to people very well when you're depressed as, as you would normally. You're, you're not as bubbly unless you're pretending to be, which some of us do very well. And your, your personal and emotional well-being is not doing well because you're, you're either sad or you're going through some type of emotion that you don't know how to handle and, and you just can't do what you normally would do to enjoy life. And it affects how you think, feel, and act. So everything you do when, you, when you're going through a mental health challenge or issue is affected by how you think. It affects how you think because you can't think clearly. You, you can't concentrate. How you feel differently. You act differently. And it helps determine how we 
handle stress when I'm ha handling stress differently because uh, it's usually because I'm stressed out and I'm not handling it well I don't relate to others well I try to withdraw from people and I make poor choices about things because I don't think them through some positive mental health things are you realize that you have you realize your full potential you know what's going on you know what you can do with your life rather than thinking about staying in bed all day you cope with the stresses of life instead of going oh no I have another day at work that I gotta deal with you work productively rather than you know I can't concentrate I can't get things done you make meaningful contributions to your community like volunteering or or helping your neighbor or different little things like that your peak mental health is not about avoiding active conditions but also looking for ongoing wellness and happiness now in the u.s the mental health population in general 25 percent of people within a year will have a mental health issue a mental health illness that's just one in four some some places say one in five either way that's 25 percent or 20 percent of people and that's a pretty staggering number but there was a survey done in tech that revealed that number is 42 percent in the u.s and for the uk folks it gets worse it's 48 percent now the uk folks the uh, british Inter interactive media association said that the mental health is a significant challenge for the uk technology industry that two-thirds of the respondents in the report are stressed by their work more than half said they have suffered from anxiety or depression at some point. And there was another stat that said 13% of the people are constantly stressed with symptoms such as anxiety attacks, headaches, and continued tiredness affecting their ability to work. So that's just staggering in and of itself that, that work can affect you so severely because, of how, because you're just in the tech industry. We do have a lot of pressures on us. These are just a general list of mental health disorders. Some of these are chronic disorders that you know you're not you're not going to get just because of stress and 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 things at work. They are things that we can can, can contribute to them, but we're mainly going to be talking about anxiety disorders and depression that can be caused by work work order work issues, and you can you can get those and they can come and they can go away. So they're not chronic things that you can keep forever. Some of them are things that people have forever, some aren't, but these are the main ones we're going to be talking about. They're just commonly treat, treat, treated and go away. The one in four people get them, they get treated and it happens to not affect them for the rest of their lives. The rest of them are things that people struggle with, such as me having bipolar disorder and, and my anxiety is just there all the time. So. so let's talk about why I'm speaking out now. I have a lot of personal experience with this. I got tired of the stigma and people need to realize they're not alone like this little girl that's walking along whatever this happens to be it looks like sort of like a train track but it's really bigger than a train track but you know when you look at how long people feel so alone people will tweet things out and they still feel alone because they're still at home especially with COVID going on and even if you're in a room full of a hundred people you can still feel alone because of how this makes you feel and then I took a look at the stats, just in particular for IT, because I was like, am I the only one that gets like this because of work? And I found out I wasn't. So a little bit more about my story. I call it the debacle of the summer of 2018. So I started a new job in June, which subsequently laid off over half the staff in two weeks, which narrowed us down to about I think it was 11 people in the company and three people left within two weeks of that and then I was like you know an eight person company really doesn't need a full-time DBA so I was just kind of on eggshells the whole time wondering if I was going to be the next one to add to that stress I, I decided to have a car wreck no I really didn't decide to have a car wreck I just had a car wreck with a boxcar truck in LA which is like the worst place to drive in the world but, you know, I was at a Seagull Saturday. Hey, what can I say? I, I told you I was an addict earlier. Then I had to deal with a crisis with a friend. I had recently changed therapists as well. And I was traveling and doing two Seagull Saturdays a month, adding to my current stressors and stuff at work and getting used to a new job on top of it. So all of those added up to, to me having a lot of anxiety about the job change. 
it spun into me having mania. At first I was depressed and then it just spun into mania with my bipolar and actually landed up in a hospital for a week. And it took me a year to get stable from that. So, and at my job before, I've had jobs before where I've been on call every three weeks and coworkers will rarely answer their phones and things like that that cause stresses. I think I mentioned my diagnosis of bipolar and anxiety and PSD before. But some other things that can cause stressors are, are, are your own call shifts. If you're on call for three weeks every third week and you're the one that gets called even when you're not on call, you don't have a life. And that adds up to stress because you're like, can I leave my house to take my kid to a basketball game? The answer is no, because I will get called. It happened to me. It's like, there's no, no. And then we have to keep our systems up 24 by 7. The pressure to not mess things up because we don't want to be the one that, you know, causes the five nines not to be five nines at work anymore. Staying up to 2 a.m. to do upgrades and new versions of SQL. You know, good thing I have insomnia. I can do that. As a developer or somebody that writes a lot of code, you know, we've got SQL developers, we've got, you know, writing a lot of PowerShell, just trying to turn out that much code and working on the same things from day to day can lead to burnout. And changing jobs when layoffs happen are personal stresses of mine that led to like the worst year, year of my life. So that's just, you know, part of, part of my story over the years, different things that have happened to me that have caused me stress related work. And there'll be more stories throughout this as we talk about different things that cause stress. So let's look at some of the stats. 86% of people would not discuss with their employer at all their mental health status, which is staggering when you consider that's where you should be getting your help from is through employer-run programs or through your health care program at work. 44% are not aware of what health care coverage they even have at work, which is even worse than not talking to your employer about it. It's not knowing if you have any coverage to get help with it. 63% say their employer has not formally discussed mental health at work. I happen to be a lucky person where uh, someone in the UK ran a 5K for depression and, and raised some funds, and our CEO, Dan Springer, at DocuSign actually matched the funds for it as part of one of our initiatives. We're, we're pretty good about doing that at our company. But without formal wellness campaigns or other communications like explaining benefits, it's hard for people to want to seek help. And then you, people are just missing days of work and you're losing productivity due to people not being able to concentrate because you're not doing fundamental things to make sure people know that they can get help. One trillion dollars is lost to productivity globally each year due to mental illness. 210.5 billion is just depression alone. 69 billion is due to people committing suicide, which is the 10th leading cause of death in 2019 in the US and 18th worldwide in 2016. And that's just, what can you say there? That's, that's just terrible. I would encourage anybody that might be thinking of suicide to seek help and call call a hotline and talk to a friend. Worldwide, 80,000 people die from suicide a year. For every death, there are 20 attempts, and that adds up to one person per 40 seconds. So these are some staggering numbers worldwide. The, the last two aren't directly, the last one's not directly tied to IT. None of these are tied directly to IT, but they, they show the impact that mental illness can have on businesses worldwide. So there are four main causes to work, or work causes to people getting depression and anxiety or having any, any other mental health issue. One is stress, two is burnout, third is harassment, and fourth is bullying. So Stress, again, is like keeping your systems on 24 by 7, not making mistakes, working long hours, Burnouts, doing the same code over and over, working on the same project and just getting tired of it and, and needing a break from it. Harassments where somebody's doing something to you that, that they shouldn't be doing and calling you names, being rude, yelling at you, uh, sexual harassment, things like that. And bullying's where they, they're pushing you around, yelling at you and things like that, which I'll go through a few stories about that as I go through. So stress and Burnout, a poll of 11,000 people shows that 56% of the people reported their stress and burnout. 
not surprised when I took this when I first found this last year that I was actually in this category. So that tells me a lot about what I know about myself. But you can take this yourself at burnoutindex.org and see if you fall into this category or not. That way you can tell if you need to catch on to my 10 tips I'm going to give in a minute. Stress and burnout. One of the things is being on call, you know. My, my current job requires me to be on call one out every six weeks, but it's also don't leave the house unless you arrange something with someone else. Um, we don't get called often, which is a good thing. But it's like, you know, when we do get called, we've got to be on there. I can imagine other people who, like I was before, I had a job where I was on call 24 by 7 all the time. I've been on call one out every two weeks, one out every three weeks. Those things add up to time that you don't necessarily want to, to be stressed out about. And we're constantly keeping our 24 by 7 up times on things. So we're trying to keep keep things up all the time because we want five nines, four nines, three nines, and so forth, so we can keep our clients happy, so we can, you know, brag to our other friends that, hey, our, our stuff stayed up longer than your stuff. And just meeting deadlines for things. We're, we're replacing new hardware at work, and it's got to be done by Thanksgiving at this point, and uh, we're, we're meeting a deadline, but there for a little while, you know, it's like, ah, uh, when are things going to get done so we can get things done? And certain projects that sometimes that happens to, but I'm on those ones that likes to meet deadlines. And we're constantly on. We're always checking emails, even off hours for work, when we're not even on call. It baffles me, because I do it. It still baffles me. And we're checking our Slack, our Teams, or any other means of messaging that we have for work stuff. And we're not on call, and we don't need to. We need to really learn how to put our phones down and not, or don't put work stuff on our phone at all. It just, it just, you know, it's constantly there. And stress and burnout is usually caused by prolonged intense stress, which right now I know a lot of people are worried, could, could still be worried about layoffs, especially now with COVID and, and the deadlines and the furloughs happening. And, and that takes, you know, a toll on people. And feeling a lack of control when you have impossible deadlines, this gives you a feeling of lack of control. And when you're constantly having to sacrifice your own personal time, you're, you're going to get stressed and burnt out a lot. So harassment and bullying, as, as my uh, sign says, no more mean people. We don't want to hire mean people. So this is anytime someone picks on you for your age, height, what you wear, what you eat, anything like that. Yelling and rude comments. I used to have a coworker that anytime something happened to a system, even though I was senior to him, he would come and yell at me. And it's like, well, I have to look at it first to figure out what happened. And plus your tone of voice needs, needs to come down. And then making fun of colleagues. I like white socks. It's no secret. I wear them with my black slacks when I used to have to wear slacks. Thankfully, I get to wear jeans and I don't have to worry about this anymore. But people were used to compare me to Michael Jackson when he was going through his whole trial with whatever he did with children at the time. And I did not like being compared to him. I've also had, we used to have this manager that was like five foot two or five foot one that was a male in our department that the other managers used to pick on him for being so short. I had a coworker that had a New Jersey accent that her voice projected very loudly and everybody just constantly berated her about that. Um, as far as sexual harassment goes, I think you know, I had a coworker that used to peer over the walls and stare at different people, including myself, and he sent the emails that are inappropriate to people several times and he was still employed there for a very long time. My favorite was there was this one guy in this one department that he was told his Playboy magazine was not appropriate for the office, but they seemed to find it okay if he slipped a sticky note over the parts you weren't supposed to see. And picking on people about their religion is just a no-no, but we had, I had a coworker one time that he, you know, his religion required him to eat certain foods, and he was picked on about it, and it's, you know, he was doing it because it was part of his religion and they, people didn't like the way his food smelled. It's like, you know, just get over it. So, how mental health can affect anyone? One of the main signs is it can make you sad or irritable. It can go either way. Because sad, sad is down and irritable is kind of up on your mood cycles. So sad, you know, you don't want to get out of bed. You don't want to go to work. 
irritable, you're biting everybody's head off, you're screaming like this guy is in his bag. You can have the extreme mood changes from highs to lows, so you can go from sad to irritable very easily. You have excessive fears, worry, or anxiety, so you, you start getting worried about different things that you don't normally worry about. You're fearful of things that you, you don't normally worry about. You All of a sudden, you're fearful you're going to lose your job when losing your job has never been a fear before. You start pulling away from people and activities, which I know we've all done that now with COVID, but you still are in contact with some people, so you would still be pulling away from some people even with COVID going on, but it's more... It's more noticeable without COVID. And you start getting changes in your sleep and eating habits. You may sleep more, sleep less, eat more, eat less. And you get trouble concentrating. So you can't sit down and fire, fire up, you know, VS Code or Azure Data Studio or SSMS and sit there and pound out a store procedure or some PowerShell and concentrate on it for a full hour without, you know, wondering about all the stuff that you're worried about. Now, some ways the things have uh, affected me in general is, you know, I've missed work. I've, you know, I was in the hospital for a week. That was a week of missed work. But I've also had to take PTO days to just get my mind straight. You know, I, I periodically take a couple of days to extend a long weekend so I can have some just downtime and I don't worry about anything work-wise. Uh, I have lack of focus sometimes. I can't focus on things unless I do things a certain way on my desk and have things written down a certain way. If, if I can get my tasks small enough, it helps me focus when I know I'm like that. So, and I just don't have the motivation to get things done. That's why this presentation was recorded two days late. Sorry, pass. Um, positives. I get extreme energy sometimes from the mania side or just from being so stressed out I just get worked up. And I, and I can't, you know, just, just get it all bottled up and go. And, and I work well under stress, unfortunately. When, when I'm really, really stressed out and it's a work issue, I, I work great. If it's not a work issue, I'm a basket case. So there's 10 ways to avoid burnout in IT. And they're very simple things you can do. You can take time off. You can identify your stressful task and Try to get other people helping you with those or find ways to make them less stressful. You're going to unplug at the end of the day. Don't do any work after 5. Your hours are 8 to 5. Stop at 5. Unless you're on call. Eat well and exercise. Two things I don't do very well at all. I did exercise today for the first time in 23 days. I'm proud of myself. I did not eat well though. Socialize with other people. Talk to people, even if it's just on Twitter or Zoom or the phone or text. Preferably, you know, every now and then get some voice communication going on in there. It, it sounds better to talk to people than it does to just constantly text. Develop an escape plan, you know. Figure out how you can escape from the situation for a little bit to give yourself a break from it. Or figure out how you can get someone else on your team working on this project with you. Um, get plenty of sleep. Make sure you're getting enough sleep at night. Cross train. If this project, this particular project that's causing you burnout is taking a long time, see if you can get another coworker to tag team it with you and you both work on the project they were working on and the project you're working on. You learn what they're doing and they learn what you're doing and you get two things done at once. You cross train and you get two projects done. And learn to say no. If you've got too much on your plate, let your boss know. They can be understanding despite what we might think of them. Other things we can do to take care of ourselves in general. We've already heard these three. We eat well, we exercise, we sleep. That's just general things you can do. Uh, develop hobbies away from the computer. And this is mainly away from SQL Server at this point or data things. There are hobbies you can do on the computer like have Raspberry Pis and things and build things out that are m more appropriate and stuff like that. But um, Get away from social media. Social media is a, a uh, trash heap at this point in time, given this time of year with election being next week, and it's normally a trash heap. So invest in some light therapy so you can get some vitamin D in the house when it's winter time and stuff like that. And do some relax re relaxation training like meditation or yoga or something like that that can teach you to relax and calm down. And spend time with friends and family. So, 
So some other ideals for helping take care of yourself is go get a massage. You know, uh, I do origami to help relax, relax, to help me relax, and just you know turn your phone off altogether for just an hour. Try it out sometime. It might be scary, but it might work. Some places you can get help is one, if things are happening at work, talk to your boss first. If it's serious enough, talk to HR, especially if it's harassment and bullying and stuff like that going on. If you talk to your boss and he hasn't done anything about it, go to HR. Don't let it continue to happen. Don't stay in that position of powerlessness where you can't do anything and stay stressed out for years. You can talk to a friend about what things going on. Make sure you have the right perspective on things. Make sure, you know, you're not seeing things off or, or just, you know, get them to help you sort, sort through things that are going on in your head, you know, when you're depressed. See a therapist. There's nothing wrong with seeing a therapist. I, I personally think, like, everybody could use a therapist. You know, and these days they have, like, BetterHelp.com where you don't even have to leave your house to see a therapist. You know? And a professional can help you deal with things even better and work out issues on why things are happening and and help you through any rough spots that you may need and, and you know and just in case you need medication you know there's nothing wrong with seeing a doctor and telling them what's going on and temporarily getting on medication if that's what you need as far as suicide goes i did want to sit the slide in there saying we we talked about that earlier if you're in a sequel family, there's a few people that have tweeted out, you know, talk to me anytime via my DMs, and it'll be confidential. We've got Hamash Watson, Steve Jones, Anders Peterson. I'd be more willing to talk to you. And please seek help if that's what you're thinking about doing. There are hotlines you can call in probably just about every country in the world about. If there's not, you know, definitely reach out to a friend. Um, plan ahead of... What, what you're going to do if something happens and, and you, you think you're going to do something, try, try to have a plan that your family's aware of so that they can help you. Tell your friends ahead of time what can help you. Like mine's like, just tell me to call my therapist if I'm, you know, acting too out of it. And as long as I listen, you know, I'm usually pretty safe there. And call, call your doctor or therapist. You know, they're, they're usually there to talk you down. They're usually not to block you up in the hospital unless you do Unless you really, 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 really need it. They, they try to avoid that. This is a map of from the WHO are based on the suicide rates in 2017. As you can see, there's a few countries on here in the dark red that, you know, have, have a high suicide rate. And you can see maybe where your country rates on that. But it's a widespread issue across the world. It's not just the U.S. or U.K. because I brought up those stats issue. It's a issue everywhere, just in general for mental health. So what you can do as a friend, when someone comes to you and wants to talk to you about about how, how you, about their mental health as a friend, so first thing you can do is listen on judgmentally. Don't jump in and try to save the day and give advice as your first thing that you do, because that, that will turn somebody off so completely, because it's like, can't you just hear me out before you start trying to tell me stuff? So... Ask, ask questions that show you care, like, you know, don't, don't ask, like, two-word questions. T turn it around and say, you know, I, I, I think I hear you saying this. How can, what can I do to help you with that, you know, type questions and try, try to show that you actually care. Be patient with the person. They may, they may give you a little bit of what's going on, but not all of it. You got to be patient and let them work through it and, until they trust you enough to tell you everything. Don't be critical of them. One of the things I get a lot is, you know, just like, just get over it and little comments like that when, when I'm feeling things. And we'll, we'll go through a list of things not to tell people in a little bit. Check in on your friends, especially if they've been socially withdrawn. If you had not heard from your friends in a while and you think they might be going through this, but with this, you might want to check on them. And that's what, what we do. We withdraw. We don't want to be around people. Don't be confrontational. Don't, don't come up to them and try to jump in their face and be all what are you doing what what why ain't you doing this why ain't you doing that you're going to make the situation worse and, and escalate it and be honest about your concerns if you're worried that they need to talk to a professional tell them so there's nothing wrong with that that's sometimes the only way people will get help what not to say to people some of these are kind of funny so you can feel free to laugh especially if you've ever heard one yourself 
pull yourself together. You know, when you're deep down depressed and you can't get out of bed, these are the things people will tell you to do. So let's see, we pull, we're together. Yep, that works. Snap out of it. So we can snap our fingers and we're out of it. That works too. Just pray about it. Yep, that's going to magically cure me. You have the same illness as my blank, so you should do whatever they do to fix their blank illness and blah, 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 blah. Everybody experiences things differently. Everybody's cure for it is differently. I can't take the same meds as someone else takes for depression. It will not work on me. It might, but more than likely, I need a doctor to tell me that. Just distract yourself. Just go do something else and it all magically will go away. I really hate when people say you don't need medication. You may not need medication, but if you're already on medication, then you probably do need it and somebody does not need to tell you to go off your medication. And that's what you can do for them. Don't, don't tell them to stop acting crazy. We're the only ones that get to use that word. Just don't worry about it. Yeah, you're, you're worried about, you know, you know, my company went from 30 people down to eight within three weeks. So uh, not, nothing to worry about there at all. Cheer up. Yeah, smiling will make it fix. I hate when people tell me to smile when I'm depressed. Therapy is for people who are weak. And I forgot the word minded on here. Uh, my father told that one to me. Things will be better in the morning. Eh, I don't think sleeping on it's going to make it better. And stop focusing on the bad stuff. If only that's all I focused on. I don't think people who are depressed focus on all the bad stuff. They try to think of good things too. So things you can say to people is like, you can be honest with me. That way they will open up to you and tell you what's really going on. That way you can try to help them better by understanding their situation. And ask them if they want to go for a walk. One of the things that we said would be helpful is, is some exercise. Plus, it, it's known that being side by side with somebody is a better mechanism for somebody opening up and talking than being across from the table from somebody. So it's less confrontational that way. So you can probably get more out of them by going for a walk, even if they don't really feel like it. They might if it's a nice day outside. If you know they're in treatment, you can ask them how it's going. If you think they need help, you can ask them if you can find them some help. And ask them how they're really doing. A lot of times we ask people how you are, and we get, okay, fine, good, you know, fantastic, better than it ought to be. Those are some that I can think of that people tell me. But if you think there's something more to it, what they're really doing on the end. And see if you can get something better. That way you can help the person. Do you want to go out and do something? I know with COVID we really can't do that. But maybe we can go to the park. And just sit on a bench six feet apart. Tell them you're glad, glad to be in their life. That's one thing you can remind them of. And if you look back at my last slide. The picture there says you're capable of amazing things. You can actually remind them of that as well. And you can remember when you're a friend of theirs, you can help them remember things that they did that were good, things that y'all did together that were good memories and stuff, and try to help them remember positive things. That way you pull them out of the mood a little bit enough to, to help them out. Now, what can employers do to achieve wellness? This is where we get into creating open vacation policies. Like, I used to have a job that only had two weeks for the longest, longest time. And that was a bear if you ever got sick because you didn't have sick days. And I worked like 80 hours a week. So, try, try to be more flexible on vacation times. I do not have that problem where I work now. Offer flexible work arrangements. That's even more important with COVID going on and people having kids at home and stuff. You know, give, give them the ability to work their 40 hours a week around flexible hours that work for the company and work for them so that they can do what they need to do. Honor the 40-hour work week. This is really important. Trying to make people work 50, 60 hours a week does not work well for people's health. Working 11 plus hours a day has double the risk for somebody getting depression. Midlife cognitive loss after 55 hours per week. So you just 
you know, you got cognitive loss if you work 50, 55 hours plus per week. Just you, you start having poor performance in your vocabulary, your reasoning, your information processing, your problem solving, your creativity, your reaction times. And it's a predictor of early dementia and death. It's the more hours that you work. And respect people's boundaries. If they need to go do something like go to a doctor's appointment, what? Let them go. I used to have a place where I worked where you could only do that during lunch, and it was ridiculous. Reconsider the open office plan layouts, because these are these are especially stressful for females, because females feel like they're being more watched and judged in these environments, and report and report more sexual harassment in these environments than they do in other environments, and feel the need to be more done up, you know, dressed up and and looking serious and stuff, so that they don't get anything done. And offer comprehensive health insurance that includes mental health. That That is, is one of the things you can do as well. If we can't get help with mental health, then we can't fix anything. So, but in a poll, there was 53% of people, the number one, number two thing that they did for consideration for a job was to have work-life balance. So you can see how important uh, the first three on here are. Other things you can do is you can educate yourself and learn to develop empathy for people with, with these mental illnesses and mental health crises that they might have. There's a website called Workplace Mental Health Topics. It's linked on my slide deck at the end. We'll, we'll tell you all about them and, and give you some different things you can do to help people. And I recommend looking at those. You can also, uh, in America, we have the ADA, which makes you um, provide accommodations to people with disabilities that may have mental illnesses. So I've got a link to that and what some appropriate mental illness, uh, what appropriate accommodations might be, such as noise canceling head headphones for people that are in the open office spaces to help them concentrate, modified work schedules, being able to work from home, organizing things differently. I know someone with ADHD that he processes his to-do list better with sticky notes. So just different things like that. And lead by example, so help healthy boundaries where you're not working over the 40 hours and practice your own self-care by taking mental health PTO. Ask for help if you need it. So these are all the things that employers actually gain from helping. They get improved attitudes towards mental health and decreased stigma around mental health across the board throughout the, all their employees. So. People will stop judging other people, and they'll have a good attitude towards mental health. You get more employee engagement into the company because of this. You get more product productivity and creativity because people are having less issues with mental health. You get an overall sense of well-being inside the company. The trust level in the workplace goes up. The satisfaction with the leaderships. People get even more happier with leadership people with this. The interpersonal relationships at work improve between employees. The commitment and loyalty to the company from the employees increase. You get less inefficiency and errors because now, now we can concentrate and now we don't feel stressed out and we're not depressed and we can actually do our jobs better. You get a decreased rate of absenteeism so we don't take PTO days at random and we don't have to take the afternoon off because we're not feeling well and and you have less turnover and stuff. So you get decreased employee turnover and that one trillion dollars in lost revenue that I mentioned way back when, it'll start coming back to you. The good news for employees, though, is that 8% of treated employees rep report improvement. So that, you know, that tells you right there that we can, we can turn this around and we can make it better with the help of ourselves, our friends, and our employers. Now, I have a little section on here to help us survive the pandemic. Because the pandemic has been wrecking a little havoc in my life with my mental health. So these are seven areas of, of mental well-being we want to nurture while we're self-isolated. One is our feeling that we're connected. We want to schedule socials. I know everybody's tired of Zoom or tired of any screen time, 
But you can do it with your in-person friends six feet apart at the park or just, you know, talk on the phone where you don't have to use the screens. Something where you're socializing with people. Uh, don't just write. Don't just text. That's what that's really about because people want to hear your voice. They want to see you. Check in on others that you may not have heard from in a while and make sure that they're, they're doing okay. And share your experiences that you're having, how you're feeling about this, because they're probably feeling the same way and they don't have no one to talk to either about it. And unless you declare your social a, a no COVID event, because I know I've done that a few times, but if they're willing to talk about it and you're willing to talk about it, share your experiences that you're going through. Another area we want to nurture is our ability to stay calm. Let's keep all the toilet paper where it needs to be, where everybody can buy it, for example. So don't panic. Turn off the news. Only watch a little bit of news. Set a time limit as to how much news you're going to watch. I personally use local government websites to stay up to date, so I watch my local news, and I look at the WHO, and I see what's going on. I do not watch the national news, because here in the U.S., that is a no-no for me. Do something for yourself, anything at all. Go for a run, read a book, clean the house, get a massage, do some origami, rearrange your desk, um, pet your cat, pet your dog, take some pictures. He looks like he might be a photographer. Um, anything. Just do something for yourself that's calming and relaxing. Color a coloring book. Another area we want to nurture is our happiness. We want to get outside if we can. Breathe some fresh air. I know I went outside the other day for the first time in like three weeks and the sunshine hurt. I should do that more often though. Get some exercise. You heard I did that for the first time in 23 days. That didn't hurt as bad. Um, except you aren't perfect. So things are going to happen and you're not going to be perfect. So just don't worry about it yet. We're all going through this pandemic and Things just aren't going to be perfect, and we just got to roll with the punches. Look for the positives. If you have to, make you a list of positive things that happened during the day, and look to that every day and go, hey, these are the positive things that happened today. It was a good day. And practice mindfulness. Again, you know, some meditation or some yoga or something like that where you, you're quiet your mind, and you get to a peaceful state of mind, and that, that'll help you realize that things aren't, aren't as terrible, they are terrible, but not as terrible as they could be. Another thing we want to nurture is our coping skills. We want first we want to set boundaries between life and work. So by the clock, we're done with work. We have a designated area for our work area. Hopefully, you have a designated area for your work area. Having it in your bedroom would be awful. I know some people have had to do that. Um, having it on your kitchen table is not as bad. Um, but try to have a designated area that's your work area. And shut everything off and get it out of your way at, at, at five. Establish a routine that was close to what you had before. So if you had a routine to go to work in the morning, I know one person who has taken their 30-minute commute and turned it into a 30-minute walk. So they walk, walk 15 minutes away from their house and 15 minutes back, and that's their commute now. And they do everything else on their, their uh, list that they normally did in the morning. And take breaks. You aren't at your desk eight hours a day at work, so you shouldn't be at your desk eight hours a day at home. So I try to get up every hour, unless I got a meeting that starts on the hour, and roam all the hallways and stairways in my apartment building to give me a little bit of a break. It takes me about seven, eight minutes. I get some fresh air. I climb some stairs. It makes my Garmin watch real happy. And when I do it. So, another area we want to nurture definitely is our health. We're all washing our hands, so we got that down pat. But our physical and our mental health are intertwined. So, as, as we've already talked about our mental health and how to get that going, we also got to make sure that we, we keep our physical health going. So, we, we want to go outside again, get that vitamin D, get some exercise. There's videos available online from a lot of people, uh, meditation, yoga, eating healthy, so we want to maintain our health as much as we can. And, you know, stay six feet away from everybody and wear your mask. We also want to nurture our sleep. Stress has a tendency to mess us up. That's one reason I mentioned uh, separating your workspace from your bedrooms. is because if you work, work in your bedroom, you have a tendency to have a hard time sleeping in your bedroom. So try not to be working from your bedrooms if at all possible. And stay off work after hours. 
The last one is to nurture some fulfillment. Productivity can feel like it's down when you're working remotely because you're not in the office, you're not talking to as many people, you've got kids running around, you got interruptions, people ringing the doorbell, people mowing the yard if you live in an apartment complex, all kinds of things going on. Don't overwork, do what you can. If you can't get something done and you need more time for something, talk to your boss. Take regular breaks like I was talking about. Go outside every hour for five minutes and walk around the block or something. Chat to family, friends, and colleagues, not about work. And I say chat, so that means voice. Um, set an agreement with your boss on realistic goals based on your situation. So if you're not able to meet the goals that you would normally be able to meet based on what's going on at home, talk to your boss. They're more than willing to help you out with COVID going on. And stick to a routine. Come up with your new routine if you have to have a new routine. Uh, I hate to call it the new norm. I hate that word. But if you want to call it the new norm, come up with your new norm. I'm sticking with the old. Feel a sense of accomplishment even with small tasks. I have a tendency to write down five or six small little things I got to do a day, three big things, and I feel accomplished if I get some of the small ones done. And look for, out for others that might be feeling alone, because if you can help others feel not alone, that helps you feel fulfilled as well. Now we're going to go back to this quote, because I really want everybody to remember it. Mental health isn't just mental illness. It's part of being human. It's very important everybody take take good care of your mental health. Now we're on to resources. There are several podcasts that I listen to that you can listen to as well about mental health. There are a few people in the SQL community that have blogged about different aspects of mental health. I've included all the resources that I use to research this. And then again, if you will visit the session evaluation link on the left-hand side navigation bar, and rate this session for me, I would greatly appreciate it. And I want to thank you for your time. And again, the easiest way to reach me is databasesuperhero.com if you have any questions. And we will go into our chat window and talk.